Okay, and uh, we got to yesterday on Perak Yud Ches, Pasuk Perak Yud Ches, Pasuk Aleph. We started this yesterday. So the Torah goes here, and we read this, by the way, on, um, uh, uh, did I say Yud Ches? Yeah, Perak Yud Ches. You got all the forbidden relationships. Right? It's on page 648. The Torah talks about the various forbidden relationships. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Any windows you can't. <clears throat> Anything you can't open up. Get some, get some cross ventilation. So the Torah starts again. It starts off with an introduction. I am Hashem, your God, which we know. And uh, the Mephorshim say that the reason it starts off with this introduction right before it goes into a whole list of all the forbidden relationships, the various forms of immorality, uh, is to realize, you know, listen, guys, I see you. I know where you are. I see you. And you can be behind closed doors. And yet, just remember, I need Hashem Elokeichem. I am Hashem your God. And it works two ways. I am Hashem your God. I see what you're doing. So there will be a count of it. Don't think you can hide from me. And number two, I am Hashem your God. I will reward you when you manage to muster up the willpower to overcome these drives. Right? That's also important just to, to remember that. So what, what we do, we read, this is the part of the Torah. When do we read this section of the Torah? On Yom Kippur at Mincha. On Yom Kippur at Mincha. That's what we read about the, the worst forms of incest in this day, all sorts of whatever you'd think you're reading in the New York Times over here. But you read the, the worst forms of your worst forms of, 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 of immoral behavior. And that's what we read on Yom Kippur at Mincha. Why is that? Because right, Yom Kippur at Mincha, it's right before Neila, right towards the end of the day where we've been fasting, we're holy, and we're at the, the spiritual zenith of the course of the entire year. This is what we're capable of. This is what so they, because at the end of the day, this is what this is what brings us down. This is what pulls us down. This area of life. And the Torah Dafka Yom Kippur at Mincha. So as a reminder, careful. The reminder Yom Kippur at Mincha. That's when we get the reminder. Okay. Now, the uh, if you look at Pesach Hey, um, what what happened here? I lost the page. Oh, oh it's at the bottom page. Okay. So Torah says, we were talking about yesterday about now following the statues of the Goy, of the Goyim. And then it says, um, es michukosai ves tapa 650. You should keep my statues and my judgments. I shall yase ha'adam v'chai bohem. You must live by them. Ani Hashem. V'chai bohem teaches us that if a person is in a life-threatening situation, so we even break Shabbos, in order to save a person's life, because the Torah is there, v'chaybahem, you should live by them. Don't call that the Torah to cause a person to die. V'chaybahem, a person who's not allowed to fast on Yom Kippur. So you don't fast on Yom Kippur, because you're, you eat on Yom Kippur, because we're not meant to die as a result. You have to keep the halacha as long as it's not life-threatening. A woman who's going to give birth, you drive her to the hospital on Shabbos. And they, every, every, the instant there's any, any uh, 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 concern that somebody's in a life-threatening situation, we break all, we do, we do anything we have to do uh, in order to save a person's life. God says, V'chai ben, live by the Torah. Don't die by, don't die from the Torah, except for the three cardinal sins. When the Chazonish, you know, the Chazonish lived in the shared, a, shared a home with the Stipler. They were brother-in-laws. And the Chazonish had a heart attack on a Friday night. The first one to turn on the lights was the Stipler. He just flipped on the lights to be able to see what he was doing on Shabbos. Right? No, you know, you're not saying that's not the time to worry about shinui's and about all sorts of. Uh, you got the, the in a, per, a person on Shabbos, somebody's a life-threatening situation. You have to break Shabbos, and you don't hesitate. And it, 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 in the same way, it's a mitzvah to that to get, break Shabbos when you have to do it, and it's a mitzvah to do it. Same way, the, they say one of the bells of Rav had to eat one of the uh, Ravarin from Bells. I think he had to eat on Yom Kippur. He wasn't feeling well, so his family members they saw he was in a tremendous state of simcha. What are you so happy about? He says, well, it was a mitzvah to fast. Now it's a mitzvah to eat. They do all mitzvahs with simcha. You know, mitzvahs with simcha. You know something amazing? You ever send us in Shul on Yom Kippur, 
we start, we, we say the silent banging, the silent, you know, the, 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 the silent banging. It's not a banging. Not, by the way, so I, sometimes I hear people banging. Their, yeah. they, 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 you hear a clop across. You can say, <laughs> show me. You don't have to, all, all it is a symbolic tap. You're not supposed to hear you know, something you hear like it sounds like something you're using a hammer or something. Chas <laughs> <laughs> show me, you could trigger off a coronary. You could, you could, you could trigger off a, what do you call it? A, 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 a complete heart, just on, right on the heart. Cause this is very dangerous. And I hear people, God, give them a clop over there. It sounds like, you know, they're, oh my goodness. You know, you're not supposed to cause yourself pain. You want to punch hard, I'll punch you. You know, <laughs> let me get a little job satisfaction. That's not the goal over here. And then let's punch each other. If the idea is pain, let's punch you. you're going to punch me harder than I'm going to punch me. It's not the goal. So, so <laughs> what do you don't think I give a clap? But what's interesting is then when we repeat it with the show, Asham Dubaga, da 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 <laughs> I'm no good. <laughs> you know, da, 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 I'm gonna burn. <laughs> you know, why, why are we why are we doing that? So I didn't know. I never knew. I know I just like okay, we're doing it. I guess we're all hungry. We gotta need something to pick us up. And I just saw recently that two two answers that I wanted to one that I just saw recently. One is that number one, to do a mitzvah, it's a mitzvah to say vidu, it's a mitzvah to confess our sins. And any time we do a mitzvah, it's a mitzvah to do that you have to do a mitzvah bisimcha. If they're doing it with happiness. So it, it's interesting. We're, we're now confessing our sins. Da 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 da. All right, we don't, you know, it's, not, we, it's kind, of a, kind of a little, it's not like, like, like one of those gets to get up and dance type of thing. But, it's a, but, but, but there's a, one, one of the opinions we, we, we because, because the mitzvah to confess our sins. You do a mitzvah, you don't do a mitzvah b'simcha. Number one. Number two, there's an idea that if a person does tshuva out of fear, you do tshuva because you know, a person is running here, whoa, I don't want to get punished. So if a person does tshuva out of fear, so then the person's tshuva turns the uh, intentional sins into unintentional sins. Yet if a person does tshuva out of ava, please leave that door open, okay? Oh, pu push it all the way open, thanks. If a person does tshuva out of, out, of, out, of, out of love of Hashem, it turns his averas into mitzvahs. So if we do it, out of joy, then we're turning all those sins that we are confessing, we're turning them into mitzvahs. So, a beautiful explanation. Okay, I messed up, but now they become mitzvahs. That's what the Gemara says. The Gemara says if you do tshuva out of love, so it takes your misdeeds and turns the mitzvahs into mitzvahs. The idea behind it is a little, it seems to be that it was the misdeed itself that caused me to do tshuva, therefore, the misdeed itself. Retroactively is seen as a that became the motivation. It doesn't, guys, don't, be careful. Doesn't mean let's go out and do some misdeeds. You know, that will do, it doesn't work that way. You can't do tshuva on account. We're just talking to Gemara about futures. Dover shalom bala olam. You can't do that. You can't go and do tshuva, do averas with the intent that, that they're going to do tshuva. But but if a person if a person what do you call it? you does the tshuva and you do the tshuva the tshuva is done out of love so it turns those averas into it turns the averas into mitzvahs. That's what it says. Okay, so that's what it says, v'chaybe. But even more than that, the commentaries say it like this: Ushmartem es chukosay v'smishvata shriyase haosam adam. A person should keep the mitzvahs. These are the statutes and, and, and laws that a person should keep. V'chaybe It should energize you. That means when a person does the mitzvahs, the mitzvahs should energize us. V'chaybe It should give you life. Not literally, literally life, life to, to, to stay alive, but it should be done with energy. Something to feel people are they're doing the mitzvahs, and the mitzvahs that feel like, 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 like they're being whipped to have to do the mitzvah. No, the mitzvah should be done with energy. We should be energized. That's why I told you they're, 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 that if, 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 you, if a person, especially the early stages of, of Torah observance, he has taken on too much, and he feels like he's being crushed under the burden, well, you know what? Get some guidance because you're not. That's not v'chay b'hem. That means that that's not v'chay b'hem. You should be energized by the a person. Has to know how much he can take on. A guy takes, especially this is especially true in the area of, of stringencies of a chumra. A guy takes on, let's say, a chumra that he's not going to carry on Shabbos if there's no eruv, even with an eruv, 
right? So now he's locked in the house all of Shabbos, can't get out, can't carry anything. He's depressed. His wife is worse. Everybody's unhappy. Who told you to do that? That's not v'chayvahem. If you're at the level of somebody who, who's energized by it, you enjoy the challenge, that's something else. You enjoy it. But if it's frustra- frustrating, who does? So when there's no alternative, when there's no option, you know, if you're stuck on an airplane and they only have non-kosher food, you can't eat it no matter how unhappy you are. Still can't eat it. You can't, you know, you know, it's not life-threatening. You'll survive the flight. You'll survive the, the what do you call it. You can't, you can't eat it. But to, to do the mitzvahs, there should be a certain v'chaib and it should, the mitzvahs should energize us. Okay. Now, you'll notice that when it comes to all these, the immorality, the Torah uses a very strange word. The Torah, term, look at the next part. Ish, ish. El kol she'er besoro lo sikrivu legalos erva ani Hashem. Any man should not go near, uh, how does he translate it? His close relatives, uh, legalos erva. He trans- that's great translates to cover nakedness, what we call to engage in immorality, ani Hashem. You know, you notice the Torah says, Lo sikrivu. Don't go near. Don't go near. They take, take chumashim, guys. There are chumashim around. There should be extra chumashim. The, the, um, uh, the, the, what do you call it? No, and, and don't ask me about this today, guys. Don't ask me about the Shabbos table booklet, which is on sale for $14 to PayPal at my email. I don't want to speak about this today, about how beneficial this has been. I know one guy, one guy who, looked, who read through it, and, and all of a sudden he learned, and the next day he was able to ski, uh, I know, I know. And, and, and these are stories that have been reported to me, but don't tell anybody about that, you know. And, and a certain woman who bought the booklet, now she's a multimillionaire, you know. So I, you know, forget about it. I don't, I don't ask me about this anymore. Shabbos table booklet. Uh, this is $14 on PayPal. David B. Kaplan, B as in basketball, baseball, badminton, and tennis. The, uh, the, the, uh, so the, uh, what do you call it? The, 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 the Torah over here uses the expression lo sikrivu. Don't go near, don't go near when it comes to immorality. This is an area of life where you find we have rules when it comes to immorality, we don't find anything else. You're not allowed to be alone with somebody who it's prohibited. To, a, a man is only allowed to be alone behind locked door with a wife, mother, daughter, grandmother, immediate relative. But you're not allowed to be alone behind a locked door and depending there, I'm not going into all of the halachic, all the halachas, but there are precautions to not be alone. Even a non-Jew, Mike Pence, has a policy that he will not be alone with a woman in an office. People, oh, you're just so, you know, you're so old-fashioned, right? No, he's on to something, because he's only saying, well, we've been saying for a couple thousand years, because that's where the trouble starts. There's no prohibition to be alone in a room with a cheeseburger. <laughs> Right? There's no yichud by a cheeseburger, you know. Hey, don't close that door. <laughs> you know, there's, there, there, there's no prohibition, and 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 you could put a bagel and a baguette together in a room together, right? There, there's no problem. We put a bagel and a baguette could be left on their own, but a a what do you call it? A man and a woman could not, because the Gemara says they not petropos laarius. When it comes to immorality, there's no there's no defense attorney. Literally, that's what it means. Don't make any defense. Don't make a, I'm immune. We're not immune. Nobody's immune. Yeah. And the first rule of life is that a, a, a man is never behind a closed door with a prohibited woman. If he doesn't want to go to Gehenna, he is never behind a closed door with a, a, a closed door. A, it's a prohibition. B, it leads to trouble. And we know that. And therefore, the Torah says, especially, lo secrivu, don't even go near it. And that's why when it comes to gen- opposite gender, you are not even allowed, you're not allowed to wink, you're not allowed to make jokes with them, you're not allowed to smell their perfume. Anything that could cause trouble, anything that could cause trouble, we have to keep ourselves distant. And that's why a person has to have brains uh, and, and realize, you know, the, the test is not, the test is not when you're in the situation. The test is avoiding the situation. The guy says to me, yeah, I was in a bar the other day, you know, wow, I sinned, you know, that sort of thing. Okay, that wasn't your test, was it? Once you're in your bar, you're dead. Yeah. Once you're in the bar, you know, once you're in the bar, the gate to Gehenna is just wide open, you know, and, you, and, you're, on a, and you're on a, what, you're on an incline sliding down. There's no, you're, you're finished, and it's a greased incline. You're, you're, you're history, right? The test was not, that said, the test is, not going to the bar. I had a remember a couple of guys at the Shiva once said, is it okay if, you know, at the end of the day, if we go, you know, we go to a bar and have a couple of beers and review the Gemara in a bar? <laughs> just to chill. I said, how about just bring, maybe 
get the beers across the street and bring them to the yeshiva. You're probably better off that way. I got nothing against the, I got nothing against the beer, you know. But it, 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 once you do that, you're dead. That, that, that's the rule. And therefore, the Torah goes through this, and the Torah is very, very. Uh, uh, all, that's why you have all of all of these warnings. Okay. In um, pasuk yudches. Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to go into the, 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 the just you know, the, the, all the the entire. It's so obvious that I, I, I feel that it's not something that people go into the, all the and analyze, analyze the, all the philosophy of why you can't this, that, the other. We all know why. We all know why. Yeah. Uh, we mentioned that the, 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 the part in which we read the. Um, Indian Kipper. Indian Kipper, this portion of all these uh, prohibitions and, and terrible sins. Should, should we understand that uh, in, in such moments of Kedusha, uh, it is what it really helps us to, to hold the rest of the year, meaning like uh, it's, it's such a such a strong pull. Probably, that. probably. It's a good point. Uh, probably that you're getting an injection. We're getting an injection, an immunization. You're getting an immunization for the rest of the year at Yom Kippur, at the height of, but the problem is there is no immunization here. That's the problem. We, it's, a, it's, it's like a jolt, an extra, an extra push, mm. but we're not immune. We are never immune. We're never immune. That, that's the problem. And, and the Torah says that this is a tricky area because it's an area of life that does have, you see, they, they, they have um, uh, 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 people who have gone, uh, 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 people who have gone on these extreme diets, ever ever liquid diets, mm -hmm. right? There are people who have gone on liquid diets and have lost a tremendous amount of weight. You know, a guy, guy weighs 400 pounds and they go on these liquid diets and just lose a tremendous amount of weight. Mm -hmm. Because because they're not confronted whatsoever. It's out of the picture. Food is out of the, it's, it's just not, on the, it's not on, the, uh, on, on, on the chart now. So they're able to do it. The minute you have to, you know, sit at a Shabbos table and there's, you know, there's a lot of food and, uh, you know, and now there's more food. And, uh, you know, I'm, uh, you know, that's much more difficult. It's much easier to go cold turkey than it is to just, than it is to have to control ourselves. This is an area where a person can't go cold turkey, because this is an area that this is an area that's necessary in life, and it's used as a mitzvah. If there's a mitzvah over here to get married and have children, but the Torah is telling you it has to be controlled. That's why it's such a challenge. If a person could just be a monk and go into a monastery, well, I mean, they have their issues. But theoretically, <laughs> theoretically, if a person if a person could just go if a person could just go live on an island. You live on an island, you know, my way of dealing with it, I'm going off to an island. Nobody bother me. I'm on the island. Okay, then it's easier. But we don't live on islands. That's the problem. And therefore, a person has to know. You got it, 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 it's a tremendous battle. This is the battle, let's face it. And I've told you many times, a guy becomes a balchuva. So what are the challenges? Let's face the facts. What are the challenges? Food. There's plenty of kosher food all over the world today. There are good kosher restaurants. You can get great kosher catering. Every supermarket in the world, and probably in Thailand, they go in there, you'll find OU, and then they, they, what do you call it? You can find, there's, there's plenty of kosher food available. I, I once read a statistic that there are over, the over what was it, 250,000 products that have kosher supervision. Yeah, and some of them are even kosher. And the, and the what do you call it, the, the uh, you know, you got 250,000, kosher is not a problem. Shabbos, what's the big deal? We're no longer in a world where you can't, where, where if you get fired, if you don't work on Shabbos, it's the best thing that could happen to you, mm -hmm. right? To get fired for not working on Shabbos, you're going to be on easy street, right? You'll sue their pants off, right? You know, that, that's a dream. So that's not a problem, right? Wearing a yarmulke, that's the same thing. What's going to happen? They're going to fire you for wearing a yarmulke, then you're also on easy street, right? Yeah, they can't do anything there. So what's the problem? The only problem is the problem over here. The problem, morality, that's an area where you have to, that's a real problem. There are no other challenges. What other challenges are there? What are the challenges? Now there's no challenge. In the 40s, in the 30s, a guy didn't go to work. He got fired. And he got a family to support. And you didn't show up on Saturday, don't come to, come to work on Monday. That was, that was well known in America. And many people, many people could, not, could not live up to that test. Because you have to have a parnasa. Nowadays, that's not an issue. So what's the issue? This is the issue. And this is the issue that has to be dealt with very, very, uh, uh, with, with a, lot of, a lot of forethought. Okay, take a look. I want to go on to, um, uh, uh, I want to go on, there's just one, uh, 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 one, one, one of the, er, the exceptions here is if you take a look at Perak Yud Ches, Pasuk Yud Ches. When it talks about the various forms of immorality, 
So on page 652, on page 652, it says, Ve'isha el achosa. You see where that is? It's about uh, eight lines from the bottom. On 652, Ve'isha el achosa Do not take a woman along with her sister. Litzror, to create enmity. Legalos ervosa ole'a while she's alive. This is a prohibition to marry two sisters. That means by Torah law, a man can marry more than one wife. According to the Gemara, the limit is 18. Man is allowed to marry 18. Man is allowed to marry, uh, man is allowed to marry up to 18 wives. Okay, by by uh, what do you call it? The the uh, the um, here the Torah says you can marry 18. You can marry more than one wife. And by the way, if you look at all the cases in the Torah where a man had more than one wife in the Torah in the Nanach, most of the time it was where one the first wife was not having children. That's why he had a second wife. That's what happened by, that's what happened by, what do you call it? That's what happened by, by Avram Avinu, and that's what happened by Yaakov and Rachel, and that's what happened when each one gave the maidservant. All right, he married Rachel because she was supposed to, he was deceived. But then Leah gave a maidservant so he'd have more children. That's what happened by Shmuel and Navi's mother, Chana, where there's a man who had two wives, Chana and Pedina, and Chana did not have children, and the indication seems to be that she was the first wife, and he only married Pedina after he had, so you're allowed to, but it doesn't mean it's recommended. And nowadays it's prohibited by due to the what's called Khairim of Rabbeinu Gershom. There was in the in the, the one of the Rishonim, Rabbeinu Gershom or Hagola, uh, there's a Khairim which the Ashkenazi communities accepted. His Khairim. And Svarti community, certain Svarti communities they did not. And this is actually an issue <coughs> at the beginning of this founding of the state, where uh, where, where uh, Yemenites, I think it was uh, specifically the Yemenites or Morocco, I don't remember the immigrants that came, and they came to Israel with two wives. And the law in Israel had already been passed that, 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 that what do you call it? What's it called, the uh, two wives? Um, polygamy. 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 What's the two husbands? It's polyandry. This is, how do you like that? Right? Yeah, how do you like that? See? The, what interested me in high school, I, I paid attention to. Right? <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the, what do you call it? No, it was something weird I got interested. If it, was, if it wasn't weird, I wasn't interested. So uh, to this day, I'm not sure what Columbus messed up, how, how Columbus messed up, but he messed up big time. That I know. <laughs> so the uh, uh, polygamy, polygamy was outlawed in Israel. Polygamy was outlawed in Israel when he had these people coming to Israel with two wives from the, from the uh, eastern, the eastern country, the oriental countries. So they passed, I think they passed the law that if you have two wives at the time, you could, those who came here with two wives, can remain married, but no longer can you marry to uh, can you marry to multiple wives. Now, even when you could, by Torah law, you can't marry two sisters. Why is that? So the Torah says the word, lo sikach litzror. The word litzror means to create enmity. And what that means is, there is a natural bond between sisters. Do you know what a mother-in-law is called? A mother-in-law is chamoto. Father-in-law is chosno. Right, it's like you say father-in-law, mother-in-law, sister-in-law. What would be the word for the co-wife? Everybody, every every relationship there has a description. In English, what do you call a sister-in-law? A, she's a sister-in-law. She's a brother-in-law. It's a father-in-law. That's a son-in-law. What is the co-wife called? That's a husband. That's a wife. What's you? What is your? If I'm one wife and you're the other wife, what is my? What are you to me? Sister wives. Oh, so they may use it in English. They call it sister wife, and in Hebrew they call it my tsara, my distress. That's the Hebrew word. That's the Hebrew word for it. Why is that? Because the nature of two wives is that they compete over the husband. So you take two sisters who there's a natural bond between them, and if you marry two sisters, that natural bond now is going to have, there's going to be a clash between the two sisters. And therefore the Torah says you can't drive that wedge between them. You cannot create the one. You can't marry two sisters simul. You can't while they're both alive. If you married Rachel and then Rachel dies, you can marry Leah, her sister. If you marry because she's no longer she's no longer alive. So the concern of creating the the, the, the the that's not that's not a concern. If you if if you divorce Rachel and Rachel's still alive, you still can't marry Leah until Rachel dies. And this was done very often in Jewish history, very often, very often, because in, in, up until the 20th century, or maybe the late 19th century, many women, it was not uncommon for young women to die in childbirth. Well, if a woman dies in childbirth, who is the most natural substitute for the mother? 
her, her sister. Right? He got to raise young children. And it was very common. Rabbi Akiva Eger married his wife's sister after his first wife died. When he was about 37, I think. His first wife died, she, he married his sister. Because you have a, 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 it was very, very common that a woman died. So the, next, the, the most natural substitute, and I even knew of a case like this in my neighborhood of a man. A woman got sick. Her younger sister moved into the house to help out with the kids. This woman was very, very sick. And she was nifter. Then I, six months later, I found out six months later that she, she married what do you call it? She married the sister. Uh, the husband married the, married the sister to raise the kids. Then I had another, uh, the, the, the real funny case was a couple that I knew in Chicago, an older couple. Uh, they were married for, for, for probably 40, 50 years. And there was a spin, there was a sister. The wife had a sister. They, were, they came over from Europe. The wife had a sister who never got married. And she was living with them. You know, they would take a walk on Shabbos. All three of them would go for a walk. It was, it was about one happy family. And uh, they eventually moved to Israel. And the wife got sick and the wife died. Now, the sister and the, and the brother-in-law were living in the same house. Now, that's a problem of Yichud. And Yichud, there's no statute of limitations, by the way. There's no age limit on these things. Yichud is also, you can't be alone. They didn't know what to do because they were both in there, probably in the, close to 80 already. The husband and the, and the sister-in-law were both close to 80, and, and they're living in the same house together. They didn't know what to do because there's a problem of Yichud. So they spoke to a rav, and the rav said, get married. So they did. And that took care of all the problems. I mean, it took care of that problem. And I'm sure the other problem, they, 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 you know, you know like all problems in marriage, all marriage solves some problems, creates other problems, right? You know, but, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, that was a very, in a perfectly legitimate solution. Because you can marry your sister, so you can marry your wife's sister as long as once, once the sister dies. You can marry your wife's sister. That's, a, that's, the, that's the way to go. But not, not while one of them is alive. That's what they're, because, you are you are you are a, a natural bond between them. Then you're 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 shattering that bond. Yeah, Mary, good. I mean, I think it's uh, uh, it should be good to explain why then Yaakov. Yeah. Was, uh, Yaakov made their different opinions about that. He was in Chutzlaretz, yeah. and it was uh, there. Uh, and, and, and according to some, that was a, a flaw. That's why Rachel died before they got into mainstream Eretz Israel, because they only kept there. Many different explanations for Yaakov marrying the two sisters. The Gemara actually says that in the future, there's going to be a banquet. And Hashem is going to say to Avram Avinu, the Gemara at the end of the Psalm, Hashem is going to say to Avram Avinu, I want you to lead the benching. And Avram Avinu says, I can't lead the benching because I had a Yishmael son, I had a son Yishmael. Mm -hmm. And he's going to say to Yitzhak, I want you to lead the benching. He says, I can't because I had a son named Esau. Mm -hmm. And he's going to say to Yaakov, I want you to lead it. I can't because I married two sisters. The Gemara says that. Uh -huh. And then he's going to say to David Melech, I want you to lead the benching. He says, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and David Amalekh will lead the benching. Uh, whatever that means, whatever that means, whatever the Gemara means, whatever benching it is, whatever, why it is that you're disqualified. You have, I'm just telling you what the Gemara And over there, the disqual Yaakov himself says, I'm disqualified because I'm wearing, wearing two sisters. Whatever it means. Whatever. And then David Amalekh benches. Okay? Who? Yaakov Avino, yeah. Yeah, and there was, and there was, and there was a certain amount of jealousy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, one more point over here. If you take a look at this, is important. The uh, uh, and the only reason I'm bringing this up, oh, the next pasuk. Actually, the only reason I'm bringing this up now, gentlemen, is because I think that there are a lot of misconception here. Nor I don't like talking about these things. These things are things are, are, are things that should be kept a little bit more discreet. But I think that it's right here in the Pesach in the Torah, and I think that everybody, there, there are certain misconceptions here. And therefore, I want to break, I want to, you know, you know, make sure if you're already going to hear about it, you may as well hear about it correctly. Uh, so it says, the Isha el Isha benidas tu masa lo sikra vlegalos ervasa. You are not allowed to live with a woman who is a nida. Now, when it says a nida, it means a woman who has uh, uh, is seen or has experienced any bleeding whatsoever. It's on page 652, uh, seven lines, uh, six lines to the bottom. Seven, six lines to the bottom. So it says, uh, a woman who is a nida is off limits. And what they, the, the, the halacha says that a husband and wife are not allowed to live together as long as a woman who has a nida is not immersed in a kosher mikvah. And for a woman, as opposed to a man going to the mikvah, nowadays there is no it's not mandatory for a man to go to a mikvah. One time in halacha, it says it's a mitzvah to go for a man to go to the mikvah, and it is on air of Yom Kippur. But even then, it's not mandatory. A husband and wife are not allowed to live together physically 
unless a woman who has become a Nita has eventually gotten to the mikveh following all the laws and making sure that, that she's no longer bleeding, and so on and so forth. The, the, uh, when it comes to the laws of the Torah, especially laws like this in marriage, so the, the Gemara says that why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu make a law like this? And again, like, uh, like all the other laws, there are certain uh, 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 Torah law, the Torah requirements, and there are added rabbinic requirements. So a couple who is, a, 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 what do you call it, a woman who is off limits to her husband. So she's off limits for generally, uh, on the average, somewhere between 12 to 13 or 14 days of the month, unless... She, once she gets pregnant and she's no longer, she's no longer bleeding. But generally, generally, that's the, the way the cycle works. Now, the benefits of the Nita laws are multiple. Like we find all mitzvahs in the Torah, the mitzvahs in the Torah have various benefits. First of all, statistically, from Jewish women have the lowest incidence of cervical cancer of any group in the world. And they've done studies, number one. Number two, it keeps a certain freshness in the relationship. Because a couple that doesn't have any sort of built-in uh, uh, rules in the relationship, the relationship could grow stale very quickly. Number three, a woman, when the woman does go to the mikvah, it usually coincides with or is very close to the time of the month that, her ovulation, that she's ovulating. Is when a woman is ovulating is when she becomes pregnant. And so a couple that has been separated and then the couple joins together at the time of the month where the woman's ovulating, so then you have an explanation why fam, Jewish family sizes, from family sizes, why, the, why, why, the, why, why the, the families increase, because it's at the time that is most potent for, for, for a woman to get pregnant. Number four, um, it, gives a woman, it gives a woman a certain, we were just talking about this in the other class about feminism, and where feminism started and how women felt they were being mistreated. Women felt they were treating as objects and they were treating as a piece. Well, they, they, finally they rebelled. What was that line, Chaim? <laughs> okay, there you go. The, uh, that's Givaldi. Nobody heard it, right? No. The, uh, <laughs> Did you hear that, Blake? Uh, Did you hear it? No, okay, I'll tell you afterwards. The, uh, <laughs> the uh, what do you call it? The, 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 what happened was the women felt they're being mistreated. So a woman, always there's a suspicion that, that it, if she's living with a man, there's always a suspicion that the man has an ulterior motivation. If he's being nice to her, so there's some sort of, he's got ulterior motivation. And when does she ever have the peace of mind of knowing that he's treating her as a person, not an object? And the answer is that there's a certain two-week period of every month where, where he can't have any other motivation. Right now, now he's got to treat her like a person. And couples have reported that the relationship is a far more meaningful relationship than that two periods. Because then the couple are their friends. They're, as opposed to, as opposed to the, 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 the object. Obviously, it, 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 like anything else, what's the goal of the Torah? Like anything else, like any other mitzvah, what's the goal? What's the underlying goal of this entire thing? I mention this all the time. What? Not stay, stay away is only for a period of time. Most fulfilling version of the relationship. That's in this particular area, but there's an, oh, you're right, but in, there's an overall, there's a theme I've mentioned many times with all the mitzvahs of the Torah, but it's not restrictions for the sake of restriction. What's the point of the restrictions? Good. What's the point? It all boils down to self-control. Self-control. That's what it all boils down to. What's the whole point of some foods being kosher and some foods not? What's the point of even making brachas, gentlemen? you got to make a bracha before you eat. So imagine, did it ever happen to you? Not that it ever happened to you. I should say, how many times did it happen to you? You come into the house, you're kind of hungry, and you're even carrying packages. You walk over to the refrigerator, kind of kick it over with your, food, with your foot. You kick open the refrigerator with your foot. You grab a hunk of salami. Take, 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 you know, take a couple of take a, a quick chews out of the salami just to get you. And then you finally put the packages down. And it's, okay, what am I going to have for what am I gonna have for lunch? Or you grab some cheese or something. You go, yeah. In Torah, you can't do that. And you can't do that. You can't come into the house like a hungry beaver. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you can't do that in Torah. In Torah, you come into the house like, I'm hungry. Okay, I got to eat. You can't just grab a hunk of bread and chop, and chop three bites out of it. Why not? You got to wash. Ah, and if you wash, then what do you got to do? Before Amotzi. 
Yarek until you die him. And you can't even make a bracha. Why not? Because you have to go to the bathroom. And you're not allowed to make a bracha when you have to go to the bathroom. So you go to the bathroom. And then you come out. And then what happens? You got to make a bracha. And it's a longie. <laughs> you finally make an asher yotze. You finally wash. Then you collapse of starvation. <laughs> I never even get to the food. Right. <laughs> what, what, you understand what the Torah? What's the, what's the whole point of this? Yeah, you know, I can't come in. I, this is all of, you know, I can't come into the into the house and just grab and eat. Yes, so everything's got to be thought out. Why is that? Because the Torah is trying to teach you self control. It's self control. Listen, we're not we're not we're not a, a two legged animal over here. I mean, even something as simple as going to a ball game. You know, I, I remember going to Wrigley Field. You go to go to a baseball game in Chicago. You know, you know, you'd, you'd see, you know, most of the locals, especially on a hot day, they basically have a loincloth on. You know, that's it. They're, they're wearing their shorts, you know, and, 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 and all they need is short, shorts and, a, and, and some money, and they can feed themselves for the next three hours. You know, a hot dog, a this, a... The Frum Kids, you can always tell the Frum Kids. First of all, we're all buttoned up shirts. With base, we're the only ones in the park with baseball caps because we took off our yarmulke so they didn't know we're Jewish. <laughs> so we're the only ones with the baseball caps. Everybody else is getting a suntan. You got a baseball cap, and you're wearing a shirt with your tits tucked in in a big bag of food. <laughs> in Pesach time, you hear crunching, right? Because they're crunching matzo, you know. And they're the only ones in the park, you know, you know uh, before you even go to the ball game. And, and not only that, where are we going to dive in Mincha? Uh, you know, before we even go to, where are we going to, okay, so now the ballparks have, Camden Yards was the first one after the sixth inning, they have a minion under, under, under the, the vendors and in the, in, in from, anybody from the way, Camden Yards, after the sixth inning, they, they dive in Mincha, All right, in Wrigley Field, now they have lights, but some of they dive in Marv. And it's White Sox, so they don't daven because you're not allowed to daven for a miracle. But the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, what do you call it? The, the, uh, the, the, the uh, you know, you know, you know, it's all play. You go traveling. You know, you know, I've seen people get on a plane. You take your credit card and go to the airport. And whatever you need, you just, you know, you, you buy. Uh, for me, you got to, first thing you pack is when you do travel, what's the first thing you pack? It's fill it. I take my fill it, but I also need a sitter. Right, and I also got to learn a little bit each day, right? So I got to have a safer, at least one safer with me. Plus, I have to have a talus if you wear a talus, okay? So before I've even packed my bag, I'm overweight, right? Before I've even packed my bag, I'm already got this package. I haven't even gotten breakfast yet. I'm already. Here. Then I got to take some tuna fish, and I got to take something. Okay, so now things are a little bit better. The shop is closed, yeah. and if you and if it's a lulav and as you're traveling with a lulav and for chutukis, so you got these people with traveling with lulav and Esther, Are you kidding? And then you got the other guys, and a woman's wearing with a hat box because she got her shaitl in there. A woman's got the shaitl, and men got their strimal. You know, so you get on the bus, you get on, you get on the, what do you call it? You look like, you look like, what do you call it? You look like a department store before you've even got on the, on the plane. <laughs> but you know, it's all about, it's all about self-control. The whole thing's about self-control. Pesach, everybody, you see people, guys are traveling Pesach with those matzahs. Forget my suitcase, I got this box, and I don't want to get crunched. All over the place. I'm not making this up. All over the place. And just be careful when you sit down sukkah's time that you don't sit down right on the point of someone's lulav. Right? Or get stabbed in the back of the head by a lulav. You know? It's constant. Listen, I told my kids, I told my kids, the first thing when I took them, the first time when they were little, and I took them to Hakafas on sukkah's, you know, you go around walking around seven times, the first each day you walk around once. And first advice I give you, don't ever stand you, anybody, don't ever stand immediately in front or behind of a child because his lulav is at your eye level, right? And that's if he's in front of you. If he's in back of you, it's at your neck level, right? And, then if you, and the, kid is, the kid is like this. <laughs> he looks like, he looks like he's, a, he's, lay, he's got a lance in his hand. And so I told my kids, the first thing you got to worry about is not poking other people. That's the first mitzvah when it comes to Lulav and Esther. Now you can go to shul. Make sure you don't poke anybody. You walk around, you don't walk around, I don't care. Just don't poke anybody. That's the first thing. So it's all about, so this is all about self-control. It's all about self-control. It's not, that, oh, let's torture you. <laughs> you can't eat that because it's trash. It's not, that's not the, it's all about learning a little bit of self-control. We are not two-legged animals. Okay, let's go on to Parsons Kedoshim. Um...
So Parshas Kedoshit is one of the Parshas that has the, I think it's the third most, if I'm not mistaken, the third most individual mitzvahs in the Torah. And the first it starts like this, Speak to all of the Jewish people and say to them, page 656, Kedoshim Tihi, you shall be holy. Ki Kedosh Ani Hashem Now, take a look at Rashi. Rashi says, Kedoshim to you. Second line of Rashi. Kedoshim to you. Hevu prushim mina arayos ubina avera. Separate yourself from immorality and sin. Shekol makom sheata motze geder erva, where you find a fence for immorality, ata motze kedusha. That's holiness. That's kedusha. So in Tel Aviv, they're not allowed to have. Today, in Yom Ha'atzvot, the mayor of Tel Aviv, who uh, apparently was dropped on his head as a child, uh, uh, got a big bump. And he, uh, the mayor, he's a tremendous, virulently anti-religious. And he passed the law in Tel Aviv. They're not allowed to have any prayer, prayer sessions with a mechitza in public places. No prayer session with a mechitza. And then somebody posted that there was an Arab group who did. Yeah, the, the Arab group, they, they, they had, what do you call it? the Arab group had their prayer session. The Arabs don't sit mixed. Oh, they don't sit mixed. A woman would walk on the Arabs, on the, on the men's side of the Mechitha. <coughs> They'd kill her. So this, once it came to the religious Jews, so all of a sudden he passed the law. Okay. We understand that that's Kedusha. <coughs> Turn off the camera, man. Uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the what do you call it? So, so we understand the number. Now, what does a mechitza do? A mechitza, <coughs> people go, oh yeah, mechitza, terrible. Mechitza, mechitza. This guy doesn't understand. The feminists, <coughs> sorry. The Yom, I always get choked up on Yom the, the, femi- the feminists, uh, what do you call it? The feminists, they rail about the mechitza. No pun intended. They rail about the mechitza, about, ah, oh, you're putting us behind the wall, and we're second-class citizens, and a das, and a henna, henna, and a hair. Could you imagine you get on an airplane, and uh, you sit down, and the plane's not taking off. And you say, why aren't the plane taking off? Because they haven't closed the door of the t- cockpit, which is a federal law today. Cockpit door has to be completely closed. Well, why don't they close the door? Because there are people on the place say, it's not fair. When you close the door, you're making a mechitza. It's not fair. Why should we be left out of the cockpit? So the plane can't take off. Ever hear anybody make that complaint? No, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Why not? Why haven't they made that complaint? The answer is, you start with a given. Based on your given, given that the plane cannot take off unless that door is closed. So if, they don't, if, if the door is open, there's nothing to talk about. Closing the door allows us to travel. It doesn't work against me. It works for me to close that door. Given men and women cannot be in the shul together. Not that they should be in the shul together. That's the other given by the anti-religious. Given they can't be in the shul together. So what does the mechitza do? <coughs> mechitza allows the women to come closer, not farther away. The starting point is they can't be in the shul together. You know, we'll do the women a favor. We'll put a mechitza. If we don't have mechitza, the women are going to be outside completely. We'll do them a favor and put in a mechitza. And because we put in a mechitza, we did a favor. Now they can come into the shul. Is that interesting? So it depends how you look at it. The answer is it depends what you're given. It depends what's the given. Given the United States, I think they're unfair because you're not allowed to get it. Cocaine. Cocaine is illegal. What? Oh, you didn't know that, huh? Shame. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, we'll talk afterwards. <laughs> I got 20 bucks. The, uh, you know, you know, given, given, given that given cocaine is illegal. Well, that's not fair. Why is that fair? Because there's a given. The given is that the government has to make sure you don't kill yourself. Since that's the given, so a dangerous drug is illegal. I have no problem with that. But if the given is that everybody's allowed to do whatever they want, whenever they want to, what to themselves or to anybody else, so then it really isn't fair that cocaine should be illegal. But you start with the given. Nobody's got that problem. Because the given is that they're responsible. Given you have to wear a seatbelt in a car. Why do I have to wear a seatbelt? What do you care that I wear a seatbelt? 
What does it matter to you if I wear a seatbelt? I'm not more dangerous without a seatbelt than I am with a seatbelt. The given is that they're the ones who make the laws and they have to worry about us, so to speak. That's why we have such efficient presidents, because they're worried about us, right? <laughs> so so the, 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 given is, the given is that they're worried about us. Okay, if that's the given. So here, when it comes to Kedusha, Kedusha is a given. And that's a given we understand that gender separation is Kedusha. It doesn't need analysis, it doesn't need philosophy. It's a given, and we all know it. And therefore the Torah says, that's where the Kedusha starts. Okay? Everybody have a wonderful day. I'm, I'm just waving. <laughs>